talked about ethics, we talked about governance. Um, you know, accuracy is, is always a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone's aware of the hallucinations and, and that kind of thing. But uh, I attended a conference last week and I heard one of the representatives of a popular uh, legal AI platform talk about a, you know, an accuracy rate of 96% in a tool used uh, to do due diligence in M&A. I don't know how that compares to the human uh, error rate, but uh, you know, how do you prepare users you know, for that so that, uh, you know, that they don't fear the potential for you know, it not being perfect, yet they still are not inhibited to go forward and to you know, begin to use and incorporate the tool for the benefits that, you know, that it can actually uh, provide. I think this is going to require us to reframe what technology means. In the past, when you think about automation tools, it was about accuracy. How close can we get to repetitive tasks? The difference, I believe, with generative AI is that it's not designed to be a tool. It is really designed to be an assistant or extension of the user. And there should be the expectation that it's not going to be perfect. And so that's why we've tried to reframe the use of these tools as helping to improve the creativity of our attorney population and using this within the context of delivering legal services and not a replacement for people or a replacement for repetitive tasks. Because there is no way for us to guarantee that the results are going to be the same every time it's used. So let, let's talk about, you know, how does AI, generative AI particularly, differ from uh, the technical innovation and process improvement that we've seen in the past? I guess expectations need to be different uh, in terms of how we're going to use the model. So the, the concept of human in the loop has been um, incorporated into talking about responsible AI and generative AI. And I think that's where it differs from a lot of the automation technology and workflow technology that's been used, especially in legal in the past, because we need to make sure as generative AI is incorporated into the, the workflow process that there are individuals and not just you know a human, but individuals at different paths and levels within their careers that are monitoring what these tools are doing and augmenting the results that are coming out. It is very much a collaboration tool. It is not designed to run in the background and just produce results. It is there to enhance the thought of the individual user that is interacting with that technology. So it can't, it, it, it can't be beneficial without having that human person interacting with the tool in real time. Right, because in addition to the humans, we're constantly training the large language model as well, and uh, uh, you know, prompt engineering is is both a you know skill and an art in, in terms of uh, being able to elicit you know good results uh, from uh, you know from the platform. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you do in terms of prompt and training on prompt engineering and other skills involved in uh, in using AI? So I think that's shifted, um, and you're seeing this with a lot of tools that are on the market, especially in legal, is that they are trying to remove the prompting aspects of interacting with generative AI um, for a lot of reasons. But I think primarily because we do have a population within a large firm that have varying levels of experience with these types of tools. And in an effort to try to create a more um, consistent output, by crafting the, the user experience to be much more straightforward, it enables us to get closer um, to having at least consistency in how those users are interacting with the tool. I think another aspect of this is when we think about education of the users with these tools, understanding kind of the responsibility of who is interacting with it. So it may be a partner with 20 years of experience that should have a different experience, a user experience and different interaction with a generative AI tool than a junior associate who's still learning. And so we want to make sure that we're educating our population on who should be using the tool, how they should be using it, and what functionality is available to them based on the experience that they have in this space. That's great. So that ties back to the tiered training structure exactly. that you described earlier. Um, so and that, that role-based training and why why you do you do need to differentiate it in that way. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm interested in the, so the, the some of the tools incorporated into, into legal have taken a step away from relying on the individual skill set in terms of prompt engineering and uh, and are 
how are they, what are they doing instead of that? So what they're typically doing is reframing the prompt. So it still allows for a user to enter a prompt in, but they're taking that information, creating a best practices prompt to interact with their own models. And I think there's a lot of value in that and for kind of general enterprise use of these tools. But again, as you start to think about incorporating some of this technology into practice specific opportunities, into client specific opportunities, that's when we start thinking about bootcamp training for individual client teams, because they will need to have the background in prompt engineering, understanding how to interact with these tools to get the type of answers or um, brainstorming that they might need to creatively interact with a generative AI application. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it reminds me, uh, since I was there at the time, with the uh, initial uh, rollout of what we called computer-assisted legal research mm -hmm. in, in law firms. And it used to be very Boolean uh, and you know, to, to, to create a, a search string that you would use on Westlaw Lexis uh, or any of the others. And, uh, and then, of course, they all went to sort of natural language searching, which took a little bit of that kind of uh, you know, practice and skill out of the, out of the mix. Um, but, uh, so in, but in addition to the, you know, the governance issues, the competency with the, with the tools, the mastery of the platforms, you know, how do PDs address sort of simple skepticism or actually, you know, more particularly resistance to change, which is, you know, a purely human trait. Uh, according to research uh, by the Thomson Reuters Institute this year, the most common emotion around GAI among business and professional services firms is hesitance. Mm -hmm. Must change management be a part of the training process? And, and how, do you, uh, how do you incorporate that? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly, certainly there's, there's that element of it. I think, though, it all kind of comes back to talking about this. We are open about, you know, what what the firm is doing around AI, what Josh and his team are doing, how we are preparing attorneys to be able to, to use this technology effectively um, and involving them in those discussions. You know, Josh talked a little bit about, um, you know, using groups of, of associates, attorneys to think about potential use cases too. That involvement of, of the attorneys in that whole process, I think all of that helps to sort of um, maybe quell some of the hesitation that, that might be there. Um, but I again, I think, you know, being open about it, making it part of the conversation, and then again, going back to showing people what these tools are and how they can help them. Really um, letting people see firsthand how this can impact their practice um, and and what those challenges and opportunities are. That's that, that level of familiarity when people can actually kind of get in there, I think helps a lot in terms of getting you to that next to that next step. Um, you know, overcoming hesitation, um, concern, and things like that, and moving towards adoption, to your point earlier. Yeah. Oh, great. I mean, I, sh I should also say, while hesitance was the number one emotion that the surveys elicited among uh, professional services, number two was excitement. That so. does not surprise <laughs> me. You know, in our conversations with attorneys, in my conversations with associates, I think people are excited about it. Um, you know, there's, I think there's, there's a lot of different emotions, but I do think that there is, um, there is some really natural excitement that's going to go a long way. And we spent a lot of time with Deepa's team of creating safe places for attorneys to experiment. So we have created exercises that use tools that are available to them with publicly available documents and run them through how to do contract extraction, how to draft a brief. So they can actually experience using the tool and we're not just talking to them about how the tools work, but they have the ability to get their hands on the tools in a real way that mimics the type of work that they might be doing. And we've seen that is incorporated some brainstorming like immediately after using the tool of like, oh, this is how I would use it for this project that I'm working on. And so we've seen that maybe hesitation turn to excitement in real time. Right, in, in a safe uh, environment. Exactly. Uh, so that, yeah, no, very low risk mm -hmm. uh, for the user. That's great. Uh, so let me ask each of you, what, what are your key takeaways so far? I mean, you've been through this experience uh, and, uh, and you're out, you, you are out on the, on the front edge of this uh, in, the, in the legal world. So, so what, 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 what right now, when you think about the condition, the state of AI and where you're trying to take it next within your firm, what, what comes to mind for you? I think when it comes to 
the firm and sort of our, our internal approach, I'm, I'm excited about what is coming next. Being able to partner with Josh and his team, seeing all of the just the incredibly cool things that that are, you know, in the pipeline um, and also just socializing this across the board at the firm. I think there there's a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunity here. So, you know, I, I really look forward to the continuing collaboration with um, with our AI and, and KM teams. Um, my other takeaway, though, is a little bit you know, a little bit removed. And that is just from, from a PD perspective, generally, I would just say that there are, there are a lot of opportunities for professional development, individuals and teams here in this space. And I think one of the things that certainly, you know, I thought about a lot as this, you know, we're, we're talking about all of this is I am not the content expert here. So what can I do to really drive things forward? You know, how can I contribute to the organization's goals and objectives around this? We know that the training component is so huge. And I think for me, it was this, um, you know, this idea of you bring a, a tremendous amount of value there as training and development professionals to be able to partner with your content, with your, you know, substantive area experts um, to figure out the best way to move organizations and firms forward. So I think for me too, for the larger, you know, takeaway is you might not be the, the content or the subject matter expert here, but you, you know, you can provide, I think, a tremendous amount of value um, in, in an overall strategy around this. And I think, you know, there's, there's, great opportunity for PD teams and PD individuals moving forward, um, you know, whether that's kind of in-house opportunities or partnering with external folks, I think they can really help move the needle. I think that's a great point for the PD teams, yeah. uh, and I'll appreciate that a great deal. Josh, your, your key takeaways at this point? My key takeaways have been that this is hard. It's incredibly hard as a technologist, as someone that's been in technology for a long time. It's it's a different experience of trying to think about how this technology can be incorporated into an organization. And for someone that, you know, I get excited about new technology and I've had to have a, a lot of patience on my side and my team side of how we are incorporating this because it is going to change how people work. And that's why the partnership with Deepa and her team is so important because it's, it's not just about technology. It's not just about the adoption of technology. It's how technology is actually going to change how individuals have are doing their work and will change how they've done that work in the past. And we need to have that partnership to make sure that in the future there is that positive, you know, net benefit that we're going to see from the implementation of generative AI. Well, that's great. Um, how far down the road do you think we are at this juncture? If you know, if getting to the full realization of the investment in, in AI that firms have made have made is 10, you know, are we where would you where would you put us? What point along the way do you think we've we're at right now? I think it's hard to generalize the industry in that way because mm -hmm. again, you know, firms are going to take different approaches, and I've always felt that with any type of large scale adoption implementation, it needs to follow the culture of the firm. Like the what we've described as our framework for Morgan Lewis is specific to Morgan Lewis in a way. Like we've adopted it to the culture of this organization and how we best think that we can um, implement the education and governance and tooling across the firm. So for us, it's just making sure that we're staying on, our, on track with that framework. And if we do that, I think we're actually very close to seeing um, exponential gains very quickly. That's great. I think that is kind of a, a very, a very smart point that it really just, like everything else, has to align with the culture of the firm. So that, that's good. My other key takeaway sure. is that I wish some of these tools were around when I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> so just throwing that out there. Uh, I bet. I bet. <laughs>
and really took stock of the things at work that I liked the most. And while I liked my my practice, things that I enjoyed the most were the, the trainings that I did for other associates, kind of being on the associates committee, the liaising with firm management. Um, and it was actually my sister who, you know, said, you should think about PD. Just talk to talk to as many PD folks as you can and, and see if that's something that interests you. So I spent about six months just um, reaching out to, to people in the space. And as as you know, I think that the PD community is is just so willing and open to share and, and talk with folks. Um, so I, I talked to a lot of people and, and kind of learned about what PD looked like in various firms and decided to give it a go. Um, and uh, really lucky my my boss Lonnie Walzer took a took a chance on me um and so I think it was right at the beginning of my seventh year I got the job at Morgan Lewis and have been there ever since and it was absolutely the right decision for me oh that's great that's great can you tell us a little bit about your team yeah absolutely um we are a team of eight now which is um which is great considering you know it was me and my boss and one other person when we started uh we um, we have a senior manager who is in um, Philadelphia. We have a couple specialists and um, some coordinators. We are all spread out across the country. Um, and, you know, I like to sort of describe our work in three sort of buckets um, that we as a team kind of work together to accomplish. The first is you know, we really focus on professional skills, um, all of those things that some people like to call soft skills, but makes PD folks cringe because we know they're so critical. Um, and, you know, our academy series, kind of all of our professional skills training falls under that umbrella. We work really closely with our practice groups, um, our practice group leaders and our training partners on practice area specific training. Um, and then we help with sort of any other kind of general associate talent projects, initiatives that the firm might be working on, whether that is, you know, something to do with retention or mentoring or, or things like that. Um, so uh, so that's kind of our our scope as a team. And I work with a wonderful group of people. They are they are fantastic. So it's it's a lot of fun. You're right. And it is a great, great group group of it people is. in the PD world. It is a great that's community. Sure. Josh, um, can you describe your journey in the world of large law firms and, and innovation? Uh, and how did you get started? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of fell into the industry a little bit. Um, you know, I've always been, my career's always been at the intersection of kind of business and technology. And I sort of took a, a leap of faith and joined another large law firm, uh, really working on proposal development. I had a background in doing government contracting and technology and wanted to work for a large organization. And through that process, had an opportunity to really understand like the business of law because I was dealing with large scale RFPs from panel clients and got to understand the financial aspect of those relationships and how to sell and differentiate legal services within a law firm setting. And then given my background, the technology started to move into more of the innovation and technology space and has spent probably the last 10 years or so really helping to build technology solutions to differentiate practice. So thinking about the delivery of legal services and how we change um, the user experience, both on the attorney side and the client side of how they interact um, with our services. So that's in, it's really fascinating actually how you moved over from more of a strictly business role to a technology role. And I think the lines become more and more blurred uh, sort of every day. Yeah. Uh, do you have a team as well? I do. So my team is structured in kind of two key areas. So on the AI side, um, we're really focused on kind of the research and governance aspect of AI. So understanding how we're evaluating use cases and tools and making sure that we're as best we can calculating the ROI of all of those use cases and investments that we're making in AI and advising the firm on kind of a path forward with the alignment with our overall AI strategy. On the other side of the house, we've developed what we call the digital studio. So it's kind of the digital expression of a lot of our practice groups. So as we develop technology solutions, some of them are kind of more traditional um, automation and user experience type of applications, but even within the AI setting, how those solutions are delivered to our clients and creating operating models around them um, so that you know they're not spin-offs of the firm, but they are really just the digital expression of how our firm is delivering services to clients. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for telling us about that. I'd like to thank my guests, 
Deepa Selbaum and Josh Rosenzweig for sharing their insights on artificial intelligence and professional development. We look forward to you joining us for another edition of PLI's PD Insider. This is Craig Miller of the Practicing Law Institute. Thank you, be well, and do great things. Thank you.